For some reason, the question Cretello was asked by the interviewer is missing from the original video. According to the transcript, the question asked of her was, quote, Can a person ever be trapped in the wrong body? What does the science tell us about this? End quote. So that noted, let's continue. The argument, <laughs> the, the, if you can even call it that, I'll call it a claim. The claim by the activist physicians on the other side is that when a child persistently and consistently insists that he, I'll use for ease of example, that, that he is really a girl, really, well then, that's it. That's, that's how you diagnose born transgender. This is not the claim of so-called activist physicians. This is a straw man of what the peer-reviewed science has actually shown us. As discussed in my first video, qualitative research into the differences between children with to gender identity clinics that persist to use said clinic services versus those who do not showed clear differences. Such differences could be noted as early as six to seven years of age. For example, quote, although both persisters and desisters reported cross-gender identification, their underlying motives appear to be different. The persisters explicitly indicated that they felt they were the other sex, the desisters indicated that they identified as a girlish boy or boyish girl who only wished they were the other sex, end quote. They also found that, quote, a marked difference between the reports of persisters and desisters was that the persisters reported that the discomfort was caused by the fact that their bodies did not conform to their feelings, whereas the desisters did not report this. End quote. These are not things that disappear, signs that you can simply ignore, casting it as the work of activist physicians. This is what the evidence carried out by actual researchers capable of adding to the conversation via peer review have shown us. Though I do find it hypocritical how you attempt to cast doubt on the scientific consensus by referring to those who accept it as activist physicians, whilst you can't even be bothered to renew your medical license. Do note that everything Patella says beyond this point is just stuff she's added. I most certainly do not hold the view she is claiming, and I know many others who don't either. Um, and that is proof that they have the brain of the opposite sex in their body. And you know, we have studies that have found changes, differences between adult transgender brains and the brains of their bi biological peers who are not transgender. Okay, so let's unpack that. Starting with the fact that nobody has claimed the differences in persistence or desistance rates, demonstrate large structural differences in the brains of trans people. Now, there are those who attempt to use brain scans to demonstrate the legitimacy of trans people, but they utilize separate sources to forward their claims. Nobody is saying, well, because trans people are unchanging their identity, large structural differences of the brain must be responsible. They say, here are brain scans apparently showing the differences between cis men and cis women. Here are brain scans of trans people, showing that their brain structure matches the gender they identify with. Now, I disagree with them on a very nuanced level, something I'm sure I'll get the opportunity to explain later on. However, I don't appreciate you strawmanning their position any more than I appreciate you lumping us all in together. The one thing the scientific consensus agrees upon, as demonstrated in my first video, is that we cannot actively change a person's gender. Attempts to do so are so destructive that they're entirely unethical. Number one, uh, the definition of a delusion is a fixed false belief. So if I persistently, consistently insist that I am Margaret Thatcher, or persistently, consistently insist that I am a cat, or a person, uh, I'm an amputee trapped in a normal body, I am delusional. And in fact, there are people who believe they are amputees trapped in a normal body. They are appropriately diagnosed as having body identity integrity disorder. Mouthful, but you get my drift. If it, so if you want to cut off an arm or a leg, you're mentally ill. But if, but if you want to cut off healthy, healthy breasts and genitals, oh, then you're transgender and you don't have a mental illness. So that's a completely unscientific 
but that's not a diagnosis. Fun fact, not only is the definition Critella gave not the definition of delusion, but her definition would class her Christian beliefs as such, thereby classing Christianity as a mass delusion. Unlike the experience of trans people, there is no truth to Christianity. Said belief is also typically fixed, being immune to reasoned argument. Ergo, it is a delusion, at least by Critella's definition. The reality, however, is that besides false and fixed, a delusion is also idiosyncratic, meaning specific to the patient. Therefore, the common phrase, mass delusion, is an oxymoron. A false fixed belief held on mass cannot be idiosyncratic, and therefore cannot be a delusion. But it can still be wrong. This is part of the reason I take issue with the whole religion as a mental illness claim. Not only is it ableist, it's not accurate. It's a culturally instilled falsehood given a special privilege in being exempt from scrutiny. Even on an individual level, scientists who are religious partake in something known as compartmentalization, where their religious beliefs are held separate to their critical methodology. Now, when it comes to trans people, it's not a delusion on two accounts. First, it's not a false belief. In regards to that, I'd ask that you check my first video to understand the scientific consensus when it comes to trans people. It's that they exist and said existence cannot be changed. Second, it's not idiosyncratic. That's to say, it's also a cultural belief. Said beliefs are so widespread that the existence of trans people is thought to have been culturally significant as far back as the late Paleolithic. That's at least 10,000 years ago. That's longer than your Bible claims the universe to have existed for by at least 2,000 years. And said cultural significance continues today. We see it in the Hijra community of India, the sister girls of Aboriginal Australia, and the two spirits of the Cree, the Lakota, and the Zuni people of North America. It was also part of our European culture right up to the 4th century Common Era with the Christianization of Rome and the introduction of the Theodosian Code. Likewise, it was very culturally significant in South American culture. That is, until the Christian invaders arrived and did everything they could to destroy them. Murdering trans people in the name of your god by three main means. Struck down by the sword, burnt at the stake, or torn apart by dogs. Given these facts, even if I lack the scientific consensus, the best you could hope for is a draw. At which point, every argument you make that trans people are deluded is an argument that Christians are also deluded. Now, thankfully, I don't have to rely on that. The science is very clear. Trans people exist, their experience is legitimate, therefore it fails to meet the definition of delusion on two accounts. That's why the other conditions you listed are acknowledged as mental health problems, but being trans isn't, because that's what the science has shown us. Um, number two, let's talk about the brain studies. There have been several. Many have found no brain differences, but we don't talk about those. There are a few that have found uh, some differences on what's called functional MRIs, and they prove nothing. <laughs> the reason they prove nothing is because the brain changes due to behavior. We have documented in numerous studies that behavior changes the appearance and the physiology and function of the brain. Um, so to have a few studies that are very small, have never been replicated, say, hey, there are brain differences, more than likely, the fact that the person has lived transgender is what caused those differences, if they're even real. Can we just pause to appreciate the statement that there are several studies, plural, that all show the same thing, and yet, apparently, none of them can be replicated? There's also the massive hypocrisy, once again, in the fact that Critella just asserts that acting as a certain gender causes these differences. No citation, no published research by her or anyone else. Just raw assertion. 
Fact is, I don't really care about the overall structure of the brain. I think that's a distraction that has very little bearing on the legitimacy of trans people and their lived experience. It's a lot like the early scientific hypotheses surrounding gay people and the psychological basis of attraction. A gay man does not have to have a feminine brain structure, if such a thing exists, to be attracted to other men. A gay woman does not have to have a masculine brain structure, if such a thing exists, to be attracted to other women. Likewise, a trans woman need not have a feminine brain structure to be a woman, and vice versa for trans men. Returning discussion to the existence of intersex people mentioned in my second video, the studies I've read on the topic of brain differences only show general clustering, if anything at all. They don't show two distinctly dimorphic groups, they instead show largely overlapping bell curves. According to one of the studies I've read on the matter, there are cis men out there whose brains couldn't be pointed out by specialists when placed amongst a group of brains belonging to cis women. Now, this wouldn't stop said cis man from being a man, therefore to hold trans people to a different standard seems somewhat strange to me. So that's my nuanced disagreement with those who forward general brain scans as evidence that trans people are the gender they identify with. I don't find the evidence as conclusive as sensationalist news articles often make out, and I don't really find it to be all that necessary. In my eyes, just as overall structure need not dictate sexuality, it need not dictate gender identity. It could be a singular element of the human brain we've yet to map something so small we've overlooked it in all our research. All we can say for certain is that attempting to force a trans person to deny who they are is psychologically destructive, and I can show the exact same thing to be the case with cis people. A while back I did a video on David Riemer, discussing his case and how it relates to both trans and intersex children. The short story is that David's infant genital mutilation, aka circumcision, went wrong, destroying his penis in the process. Then a terrible man by the name of John Money who believed, like Cretella, that a young child, or infant in this case, could be taught to impersonate the other gender. He convinced David's parents to have him reassigned as a girl, both socially and physically. However, as much as Money attempted to make David accept that he was a girl, David rejected this. Only after David developed gender dysphoria, showing all the symptoms seen in trans people, did his parents finally tell him the truth, and begin to allow him to medically transition back into being a man. What this shows us is, if there's not a deep-rooted psychological difference between cis people and trans people, then affirmative care for trans people should actually cause gender dysphoria. But it doesn't because there's an observable difference between the two. I may not understand the mechanism fully, but I can observe its effects. I can also observe the fact that being transgender does not meet the general definition of mental illness, in that it in no way impedes a person's life. Gender dysphoria does, but gender dysphoria is not a universal experience in trans people, and can be alleviated by allowing those with it to medically transition. So how do we know, Dr. Cretella, that what you said, that no one's tr ever born this way, how do we know that? If a brain were somehow the wrong sex, due to factors before birth, every single identical twin would have the same gender identity all the time, but they don't. Why? Identical twins have, identi have identical DNA. So if it were in the genes and solely in the genetic, the, the DNA solely there, then 100% of the time they would both be transgender or both be non-transgender. The best twin study we have shows that the vast majority do not match. If you have one identical twin who's transgender, 72% of the time the other twin is normal. That tells us that it's post-birth effects that primarily impact your identity. Post-birth effects, not pre-birth. Except as any real scientist will tell you, that's not how twin studies work. Nor is it fair to reduce nature in the 
nurture versus nature debate, down to genetics alone. There are many things which affect an individual's development trajectory that fall within the realm of nature, yet are not genetic. Take, for example, nutrient intake, particularly during gestation. You see, identical twins don't actually exist in a scientific sense because it's a misnomer. That's why instead we have what are known as monozygotic twins, twins which share the same gametes before dividing and forming two individual fetuses. Now, before they divide, they were identical, but only because they were still part of one single organism. That will change us, however, once they separate. One common difference in fetal development of monozygotic twins is nutrient allocation. If one twin receives more nutrient than the other due to positioning, that can result in simple differences such as those pertaining to size. But even more can start to change thanks to epigenetics. That is, genes can become active or inactive during our lifetime due to environmental pressures. This can result in massive differences even between people who, to begin with, came from the same gamete. You see, genetics is not a rigid blueprint like a lot of people think. You're not just handed a set of genes and will develop in accordance with a very limited set of criteria. Your genes change as you grow, from the moment of fertilization right up to the day you lay to rest, and we can't control every single variable. The difference in giving one child one less french fry might appear inconsequential to us, but only because we can't account for that many variables at play. Enter chaos theory. Now it should be noted that whilst these changes occur as the fetus, infant, child or adult grows, they are not part of nurture. These are still things completely out of our control. Which is why no, we don't expect to see 100% concordant rate in twin studies if there is a genetic component. Nor do we look to monozygotic twins on their own and make a judgement based on that. Instead, we compare monozygotic twins to other child couplings, such as dizygotic twins or even siblings. Dizygotic simply means that the twins came from separate gametes. And when we do that, we find that the rates of concordance drop from around 20 to 30 percent down to 0 to 5 percent, which is why the studies on the matter conclude that genetics has a significant part to play. Sure, it's not the only thing involved but it does not need to have a 100% concordant rate like Vitella is pretending. And this is all basic psychology, stuff we all learn at an introductory level. So the fact that Michelle Quitella is pretending otherwise lets us know that she is knowingly and willingly lying, all as a means to defend her religious ideology. Fact is, how a person becomes transgender is pretty damn irrelevant. As evidenced in my first video discussing attempts to change a trans person's gender, and earlier in this video when I discussed David Reamer, we cannot actively change a person's gender. Supporting a trans person in their transition, whether it be social or medical, is the only ethical course of action to take. That is what matters. The only reason Critella is trying to argue about the origins of trans people is as a means to undermine affirmative care. Something which, even if she were right, would not follow. Let's say trans people are the result of some unrealized aspect of nurture. Let's just ignore the evidence and say all of that is true. Once you have a trans person sat in front of you, none of that matters. There is nothing you can do to stop that person from being trans without tearing them apart. So why are you wasting your time on it? Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to have a genuine conversation about what causes cis and trans people to be the way they are. But when that's a conversation not taken in good faith, only being raised as a means to try and justify hurting trans people, I'm not really interested. You're just a sick person who gets a kick out of hurting others. So I think that's enough for today. I hope you appreciate my continued pain in dealing with this charlatan. Next video, we'll be discussing Ritella's rejection of the scientific method, as well as why the fact that science didn't have terminology for science until recently, that doesn't then mean as part of some conspiracy.
As always, please check out our other videos. You can also support Essence of Thought via Patreon and in doing so, help us become ad-free. We'd just like to say a big thank you to everyone who's already given to the channel, giving a special thanks to following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, McGay, Steve Corbin, Caitlin Smart, Wellington Marcus, Atlas5, and Sash Daniels. And for myself and Adita, take care now.